All right, I'm going to start the uh, release tutorials for the uh, SU-25 Frogfoot. Um, this is a pretty much a one-to-one -one representation of the real Frogfoot. Um, it should be accurate within about one block. Um, there are some differences just because of you know the size of blocks and store marks, and um, you know some changes based on what uh, just needed to happen to accommodate all the features. So uh, we'll do a quick exterior walk around. Um, I'm going to release uh, some weapons packs so that you can just drag the weapons in place and they'll auto attach. Um, that will come with the packs. Uh, we'll go through the different uh, types of weapons that are on the stations here on the exterior walks around. So um, the stations are numbered one through five. This is the port wing of course and the starb wing the other side. One is going to be your outermost station. Two, three, four, and five uh, counting from out to in. So that's important as you uh, use your weapons panel so you can uh, designate the right um, type of weapons. So stations one through three, um, all these stations do are either drop munitions or launch them. So these three stations can accommodate um, any missile or bomb essentially that you would drop or launch. So here are three of my comets on here. Um, you can put those on and they will either launch or drop. You can put bombs on there and they'll drop. Station four could also accommodate any of these types of missiles or bombs, but Station 4 can also accommodate rockets. So if you wanted to use this rocket pod or a rocket pod, you would want to put it on Station 4. That's because you need the logic to go through the hard point on Station 4 and 4 alone, and that will launch the rockets. So on Station 4 on either side, as you notice, I have the rocket pods on there. That would be the station you need for, uh, for launching uh, rockets. Station 5, again, can accommodate anything. It can accommodate missiles um, or bombs. It cannot accommodate rockets. But Station 5 specialty is fuel pods. So uh, Station 5 is plumbed up with pipes to go into the shoulder tanks, which then feed the main tank and feed the engines. So these are droppable fuel uh, pods that hold uh, 152 gallons of fuel. So if you want to put on fuel pods, they have to go on station five. So there are your two stations. All right, so walking around to the wingtip. Um, these are modeled after the real SU-25. They have uh, landing lights that lower down uh, when the gear is down. So these are controlled via the gear. So if the gear is down, the lights will be down. If the gear is up, these lights will fold up and into the, uh, into the tips here. Uh, there is a light switch to turn on and off the landing lights. So walking around the back of the Frogfoot, one thing on these ground attack aircraft, which are going to have a high chance of running into um, gunfire, is uh, it's important to have redundancy. So we have uh, the inboard most control surface is a flap, and these outer two control surfaces are ailerons. So there's two of them, so they're redundant. So there's actually been quite a few flights where I've been hit by gunfire and either the inboard or the outboard aileron have been hit and because there are two of them I can still control the aircraft and I still have roll control because there's redundancy. So there's four ailerons total that makes it so that we can we can have one hit and the aircraft will still be able to uh, return to base. Coming around the tail we pretty much have the same on the other side. This uh, paint scheme is a realistic paint scheme based off some of the photographs I found online. We have the intakes of the uh, twin turbines. Coming to the nose here, we have a uh, laser distance sensor. This will shoot out a laser that we can use to either um, guide laser guided munitions or um, one of its most important functions is to act as a spotting laser. So you, especially when you're launching missiles, you want to uh, get them in the general vicinity of where you're aiming so you want to use the laser to you know say you're shooting a ship you want to put the laser on or near the ship so that the uh, missiles have a better chance of tracking also if you notice the laser I'm sorry this is um, the laser is directly above the auto cannon so the auto cannon will fire uh, pretty much where the laser points so if you want to shoot a ship and you put the laser on the ship that's going to give you your best chance of landing hits with the auto cannon the center um, camera here is also used for uh, spotting and targeting. So you can turn that camera on, zoom in and out, and you can uh, put it on targets to 
help identify. You can also look through that camera as you're shooting. And that pretty much, as you can see, it's right next to the laser, so that pretty much lines up. So you can also look through the camera for uh, lining up. All right, so we will jump in the cockpit. So um, again, pretty much the dimensions are all based on the real frog foot. So um, you know, you jump right in. First thing we can do is we can equip our parachute and sit back on the seat. You'll notice that the seat comes with a headset that makes sure that the engines aren't too loud so we can actually hear what we're doing in here. So we'll quickly just go through all the gauges. So first thing I'm going to do is I'll turn on the master power just so we have some power here. Uh, let me just make sure we do not have infinite electricity on. We're good. Okay. So the first screen here, that's going to be our targeting camera. So this button under here, you'll see it says monitor on, IR off. So if we click that once, we get on. Click it again, we get the IR camera for night operations. One more click is off. So let's click it back on. We have zoom in. And underneath that, we have zoom out. Over here, we have laser. So as you can see, that's our laser. We can zoom all the way into the laser. And as you can see, where we're aiming on the mountain. And as I said with the gun, if we use the laser, as you can see, our bullets all hit within the range of the laser. So that allows us to get a good uh, shot pattern. And as you can see, the laser lines up almost to the perfect center of the camera. So as long as your target is in here, which I'll probably end up adding a reticle at some point, but as long as your, uh, you know, you look, your target is in the camera, that's going to give you a good chance of hitting. So that's why it's called the target camera. All right. So to the right of that, we have a um, PFD. This is uh, from Sky. Um, it has our airspeed in knots, our altitude in feet. Um, once it goes, I think about above 7,500 feet, it will go into flight levels, and it will use double digits. Underneath that, we have our compass. To the right of that, we have Thales vertical speed indicator. This will not only show our vertical speed, but it also helps with the autopilot um, so that we can dial in our vertical speed because our, our autopilot uses a vertical speed mode. To the right of our, uh, of our camera panel, we have our number one engine RPM and our number two engine RPM. Of course, they're zero because the engines are off. Below that, we have fuel in gallons. It's 957.22. And uh, if I were to, uh, let's quickly go in outside view. So right here underneath the uh, this, this hump right here, that's our main tank. So we have our main tank here. And then we have two shoulder tanks. We have one here and we have one here. So these, the main tank and the two shoulder tanks are added together, and they'll show us our total onboard fuel of uh, you know, our, inter our internal uh, fuel stores. Um, so the way these work is the first thing to burn off is going to be the shoulder tank. So that will bring us down to about 700 gallons. All right, so we have 150 gallons um, split, 150 plus gallons, what is it, that would be uh, 257 about gallons in our shoulder tanks. Once the shoulder tanks uh, drain, then the fuel pods will start to drain if attached. So as you can see, we have two gauges here for our fuel pods, port and starboard. So once we get down to around 700 gallons showing on this gauge, you'll notice this gauge stops reducing because then we start burning off the fuel pods. If we didn't have fuel pods, this gauge would continue to burn down. So first thing to burn is the shoulder tanks then the pods if attached, and then the main tank, and then that will go down. Once that, uh, once our fuel in our main tanks gets below 200 gallons, we'll get a blinking red low fuel light. So the aircraft's pretty fuel efficient, but it's it's also a military aircraft designed to go out and do a strike. It's not designed for long, um, you know, long long ferry trips. So if you are going out there at 250 knots. Um, Consistently, you're going to be burning through your fuel pretty fast. If you slow down to say 130 knots, um, you're going to be burning fuel much more slowly. All right. So moving to the right of that, this is going to be our uh, essentially our navigation panel. So this aircraft um, is a pretty old aircraft, and it had a had pretty basic navigation. So I didn't want to put any you know really futuristic or modern day navigation in there, like moving maps and waypoint systems. I wanted to kind of keep it um, on the simple end and make it um, both simple and effective to use. So 
this works off of a, uh, it's, it's kind of like an ADF. So essentially it's gonna point to where the waypoint is. So we're gonna get a bearing two. So for example, let me, let me put a point out here at the nuclear power plant. We'll set a waypoint on our map. So this will allow us to navigate in career mode. So in career mode, as we know, we're not gonna get a 3D waypoint. So we wouldn't be able to see that waypoint. So how are we gonna navigate there? Well, we'd use this nav panel. So first thing we do is since we, we put the waypoint on the map right there, now we're gonna to go to our large keypad and we're gonna input waypoint and hit submit. Now you'll notice the bearing two changed. Now it's showing 10445. So we're we're pointing at 128. The waypoint you can actually even see the uh, the stack of the uh, nuclear power plant where I put that waypoint, it's right there. So as you can see, that's 128, that's 104. So it's showing us that if we turn to 104, we're gonna aim for the nuclear power plant. It also shows us the distance to the nuclear power plant. So that is 2.9 nautical miles. It also shows us our ETA. Now the ETA is reading zero because we're not moving. All right, so once we're up there flying, this will give us our ETA in minutes. So if it said 0.5, that would be 30 seconds, you know. So 0.25 would be 15 seconds, all right? So we have bearing two, we have our distance in nautical miles, and we have our ETA. I'm gonna do a, uh, I have done a video on this na navigation. I'll do an, one, another one of these quick tutorial videos on that. Next to that, we have our landing lights. So as I was talking about those landing lights that tip down on the wings, that's how we activate those lights. We'll shut those back off. Down from there, we had master power, which we did hit already. We have our engine start stop, so if you click it, engine will start. If we click it again, engine will stop. So if we click it and leave it on, the engine will come on and turn on. We'll actually just let those pop on. And if we click it again, they'll shut off. That's simple as that. So you'd leave it green if you wanted to run the engines. Right to the uh, right of that, we have our battery. As you can see, we're losing uh, battery power because we're powered up and using battery. There is an automatic clutch in here controlled by PIDs um, tied to the turbines that will automatically um, increase the clutch and decrease the clutch so that we're only using the power that we need to maintain a full battery. So you'll often notice on the ground that this is still going down because we're idled, but once we throttle up, we'll be making enough uh, RPM on the turbines that we will be recharging our batteries. Below that, we have our charge discharge meter. So as you can see, we have a negative number. That means we're discharging battery, which makes sense as we're losing battery. To the right of that, we have our brake release. So our brakes default on, as you can see by this brake light. If we release the brakes, that light will go off and we, are no, we uh, can move. Below that is heat. So as you can see, the heat symbol comes on. There's a heater under a seat, which is good for if we go to a high altitude or to the Arctic. Here is the closed canopy, as you can see, our canopy closes. We have our flaps up, which they default in the up position, and we have our flaps down. So each click is 25, so that would be 25% flaps. So that's one click, that's 25% flaps. That would be 50, 75% flaps, and 100% flaps. I recommend 100% flaps on landing. Uh, you can take off with any flap setting you want. I recommend between 50 and 100% for takeoff. All right, and that's indicated here, of course. We can raise and lower our gear with the gear uh, switch here. As you can see, I put the gear switch up and they do not raise. There's also a distance sensor on the bottom there. As you can see, it's that front distance sensor closest to the camera. That prevents us from raising the gear on the ground. And that makes perfect sense. Just like a real aircraft would have uh, squat switches so that you could not raise the gear on the ground, this will not allow you to raise the gear below 10 meters from the uh, ground, I believe. So, you know, this, this saves you from if you accidentally click that on the ground, you're not gonna raise the gear and, you know, it would be difficult to lower them again. So we'll make sure our down is gear down, up is gear up. Pretty simple. All right, we'll come across to our autopilot panels. So we have our, our heading hold, and it, as you can see there, it says zero to disable. All right, so if there is a zero input in here, which as you can see there is, that will shut off our heading hold. So we need two conditions before we can do any autopilot function. One is have the autopilot master on, and two is we need to have a number 
in either heading hold or, or we need to have a number in altitude. If there's zeros, neither of these are working. So why is this a good strategy? Well, let's say we, we want to control our altitude manually, but we want to keep our heading held by the autopilot. So we could put in, let's say we want to maintain this heading of 128, but we want to control our dive to hit a target, but we want the plane to stay on target. We could put in 128, we could turn on the autopilot master, it would maintain our heading, but we could control the uh, the pitch and the altitude because the altitude is set to zero and that, that causes this to be off. We could also do the, the opposite. We could put a zero in here and we could put a, say, 2000 in here. And that means now that we are controlling the heading because it's set to zero and the autopilot is controlling the altitude. All right. So I set this autopilot up to work like real aircraft. So I was a commercial airline pilot. My degree is in aeronautical science. So one of the things that real um, jet aircraft often have is you don't just put in the altitude and it automatically flies up to the, uh, the altitude. You put the altitude in, then you have to choose a method to get up to the altitude. So, you know, in an airline, there, there may be three different ways you can do that. Um, you know, a, a more basic system, and you know, this is one of the ways you could do it in an airliner. Say I, I'm in the airliner, I'm at 1,000 feet, and they tell me to expect 2,000 feet in 10 minutes. I could put 2,000 in, and the plane will stay at the altitude that I set it at. So, the way this autopilot works is if you turn on autopilot master and you have a number in here, it's not going to climb up to that until you set the vertical speed you want. So it defaults to zero. So it's going to try to maintain zero vertical speed until you input a vertical speed. So let's say you put in 2,000 and we want to climb up to 2,000. It's going to level us off, so it auto levels us. And then I'm going to click the vertical speed up as many t to set the rate I want to go up to that. So each click is 100. So if we want to climb at 1,000 feet per minute, we just click it 10 times. All right. So that would climb us at 1,000 feet per minute. Use, we could see it on the vertical speed indicator up to 2,000 feet. Once we get within, I believe it's 30 meters of, uh, of the captured altitude of 2,000 feet, we're going to get an altitude capture slash hold. So once we get in there, you'll notice this green light will turn on, and the autopilot's going to change the way it does it. Instead of using vertical speed, it's now going to use the PIDs to try to maintain the altitude we put in there. So it's going to automatically capture that altitude. So it will stay and hold green. If we want to descend, we'd use the vertical speed down. Every time we change a number in this altitude, this will automatically go back to zero vertical speed. So we can reset it every time. So the reason that's good is let's say we leveled off at 2,000. Let's say we want to descend back to 1,000. So we put a new number in there. The green light's going to go out, and we're going to have to manually now descend at the rate. If we didn't do it, if I didn't do it that way, you'd put in a thousand, and you'd still have a positive vertical speed in there, and it would start climbing you, even though you want to descend. All right, so that's our autopilot. All right, so next uh, set of gauges we have in here are weapons control panels. So you notice we have a set on our port side and our starboard side. Pretty simply, that's our starboard weapons panel, and that's our port weapons panel. Now, we have a couple buttons on either side that are different, so let's start with our starboard panel. So our starboard panel has the master arm button. So in order for us to fire weapons, we need three conditions to be uh, fulfilled. First condition is we need to have the master arm on. Without the master arm, none of our weapons will work. Second condition is the space bar. So I'm going to press the space bar. All right, the space bar is our trigger on our seat. So the space bar actually fires the weapons. The third condition is we need to select a weapon. So let's select guns. All right, we did this earlier. Now I'm going to press the space bar, and as you can see, it shoots a gun. All right, if I wanted to shoot a, a rocket, I would select rockets. Rockets are on this side. All right, so why do it this way? Well, you would do it this way because, let you know, right now we have missiles on, so... You know, we probably want to f shoot the missiles one at a time, but let's say those are all bombs, and we want to go in and we want to destroy a runway, and we want to drop all six bombs at once. Well, we could go station one, two, three. Those are our three outside stations, and we could do station one, two, three. Well, we could come in on a 
on a bombing run, and if we hit spacebar, we would drop all six of those outside stations. All right, so that's the point of doing it this way instead of just cycling through, or you know maybe be able to pick one at a time. This allows you, if you want, to fire multiples. All right, so then next we have rockets. So if we select rockets again, as I said on the exterior walk around. Station 4 is our rocket station, so we need the rockets on Station 4, or we could put something else there, but if we are going to use rockets, they have to be on Station 4, because the logic goes through those, those particular pylons and allows us to fire rockets. Alright, so, so that's Station 4. So if rockets are selected, what's going to happen is we're going to get one rocket out of each rocket pod, for each click of the spacebar. So we're going to get one out of port and one out of starboard for each click. So they'll do that until the uh, rocket pods are exhausted. Alright, so we'll deselect that. Next station that we're, I was, okay, so back here we have four. Alright, so four is where our rockets were. Well, let's say we didn't put the rocket pods on, we put bombs on there. So if we had bombs on station four, we could just drop them like normal. We right master arms on, we have four selected, we could press space bar, and those two rocket pods would actually drop off. So if you want to fire your rockets, make sure you use the rockets button. Let's say you fired all of your rockets and you just want to lose that weight. You don't want to carry the pods around anymore because they weigh something. Well you could drop the pods. So you could then go to that and drop the pods. Or if you decide you don't want to carry rockets this flight, you want to put bombs on there or more missiles you could fire them conventionally like that. Station 5, again as we said on the exterior walkthrough, that's our fuel pod station. So if you notice here we have our gauge for our starboard fuel pod and our gauge for our port fuel pod. Let's say we burn through all that fuel and they're both reading zero and we want to get rid of that weight. We can select station 5 on either side, we can press spacebar and we can drop our fuel pods. And again, if we wanted we could put bombs or we could put more missiles on station 5. All right, so that is those are those are all of our weapon stations. So next we have our throttle. Our throttle controls both engines. It's on our port side. It goes from five to sixty. This is our engine and RPS. So five is five RPS. That's our idle. Sixty RPS is our max. So the best and easiest way to control that is with the one and two key. So if we press one, as you can see, the throttle goes up. If you see two. Two goes back. Now it looks slow, but this is a perfect setup so that we have very nice uh, control of our throttle where we can easily, you know, a couple taps we can slow down five knots, a couple taps we can increase by five knots. If we hold it, we actually increase speed very fast. So the, uh, you know, we get a good rate of acceleration, a good rate of deceleration, but we're not, you know, taking off in like 20 feet, you know, so it's a much more realistic experience. All right, so that is our our uh, exterior and our interior tour of the Frogfoot. This sh should be releasing soon. And uh, in the next video, we'll start getting into actually taking off. Thanks for watching.